Hello! Thank you so much for joining us for this week's podcast for Scott Week. I'm so excited. We have two of my favorite people in the whole world. We have Ryan Hendrick, director, and Sylvester McCoy. Welcome, boys. How are you? Very well. Absolutely fine. Absolutely. <laughs> Hello. Oh, there you are. <laughs> I was feeling a bit of a pudding there, you know. Anyway, it's nice to be <laughs> seeing you. Oh, my goodness. Indeed. So, um... We have so much to get through today. I'm so excited. But so Ryan and Sylvester came together and there's a new film that just got released in the UK, the US next year, and it's called Lost at Christmas. So who wants to tell us about the film? Ryan, do you want to tell us what is the story about this film? Sure. Uh, Lost at Christmas is about two strangers who come, who are forced together on Christmas Eve in the Scottish Highlands and have to reluctantly team up to try and get home for Christmas. And it's a story about loss and grief and sort of how a stranger can impact your life at a point where, um, where you're at an all-time low. Um, the, the whole basic concept being about someone who can come into your life, make an impact, and then they move on again. That's beautiful. And so it just came out, is it December 4th in the UK on streaming and in theatres? Oh yeah, yeah. It's just it's just come out um, in cinemas across the UK where they are open, and it's just come out on digital. So it's on Amazon, iTunes, Google Play, Sky Store, etc. And it's just been a bit of a mad whirlwind. Uh, it's a bit of an un unpredictable time. We don't really know how things are going to happen. There was cinemas that were shut that are now showing the film that have just reopened. So it's a it's a it's a constantly changing environment, and we just kind of have to roll with it. I mean, I literally just got back from dropping uh, a hard drive with the film on it to a cinema in Dumfries. That's just how crazy it's been. It's like, okay, we need to start showing it tomorrow and our internet connection isn't very good, so we need you to come and give us the film. Okay, <laughs> I'm in the car. And that's the second time that's happened in the last week. You say it's on Amazon. Can people in Holland see it? On no, it's, it's just in the UK. Uh, the, re the, the reason being, we, it was so tight, because uh, particularly in America, they wrap up all their Christmas content in be between May and July. And yeah. we were actually, cause, because we shot the film in January, all the post-production happened through the year, and we only got finished at the end of September. And we only just, by the skin of our teeth, got through to get it in the UK this year. And a lot of people were actually talking about and voting for us to get a hold it back till next year until yeah. all over but um i was adamant that um we should be really be supporting our independent cinemas with all the big films pulling out and with so many cinemas particularly in scotland in the more um rural areas because they're now in lower tiers they're able to have cinemas open safely yeah and it just see it just seemed wrong not to put out a new scottish film around cinemas to try and support them um, Aye, that's very true. Aye, I agree with that. Aye, yeah, I thought you might. Don't you, Hen, Kelsey? Aye. Aye. She's uh, Scottish okay. too. You can tell by her hat. Her head. <laughs> yes, he does. Yeah, no, that's great. No, it's really good that um, you, you've done that, really. Um, uh, and so, did you show it in um, uh, up in uh, Fort William? Was there yeah. a festival there of some sort? Well, they wanted to premiere the film. Yeah, and obviously, with uh, with what's going on with the restrictions and you can travel for work, etc. I thought we might be taking the mick a little bit if all forty of us rolled up to Fort William. <laughs> so um, it just became it was it, so it was like a it was a premiere, but it, I went along with the, with Natalie and Kenny, our lead actors, um, to do our duty of opening the film and be seen, etc. And it was packed. It was packed. It was it was obviously socially distant, but it was sold yeah. out. And it was really because usually you go to a premiere, you know, you you go into a large auditorium, and everyone in the room is either in the film, worked in the film, connected to someone in the film somehow. So you have and they've got the granny as well. Exactly. You know, it's it's and it's hard to judge because everyone's there. Everyone's already on your side, but you're yeah. there with a, a a paying audience who do not know you, have no connection to the film, and have chosen to come out tonight to support this Scottish film. Yeah. And it's been incredible. Uh, I like to sit at the back of the room in a cinema and try and read the room and try and figure out how they're 
how they're taking it. Are they bored? Are they moved? Are they laughing at the right bits? How many people leave and don't come back? Uh, <laughs> um, and it's, it's, it, was, it was fascinating. And then I've been hearing from all the cinemas this week, and they've, uh, I mean, particularly in Fort William, they said that it's uh, the strongest turnout they've had for any film this year. And it's oh, that, been, yes, that's good. That's great. Yeah, so I'm, I'm thrilled. Uh, yeah. That's great to hear, yeah. Oh, good. And uh, I went onto your website and I watched the trailer for the film and it looks amazing. And I'm so, so excited for it to come out in the States or maybe you can send me a little thing that can pay to watch it. But um, the scenery as well was absolutely breathtaking. And I know, Sylvester, talking to you, you're from that part of Scotland. And I... all shot and, th- shot in Scotland and all the crew and, and the talent and everything was in Scotland. And so it's so exciting to see another amazing film come out of Scotland. Um, but Sylvester, tell me about your character in the film. What was that like? And were some fun things and some challenging things? Well, yes, the challenging thing was actually getting there. <laughs> <laughs> there was a hurricane. It had been a hurricane in America. And what America tends to do is it has its hurricane and then exports it across the Atlantic and we get the tail end. But this tail end was, wow, what a, what a storm it was. Um, in mm. fact, on the way there, uh, you, we're, imagine you're in the highlands. There are no lights anywhere. There's just mountains, and you don't see the mountains until you hit it. Bang. Or, <laughs> or, or a highland cow. You go along and suddenly your nose is in the, the backside of a highland cow because you can't see anything in front of you. And we're driving along, but we saw this white van had been blown off the side of the road. So we got out and went down to see if the guy was all right, you know. But uh, um, there was some police tape around it, so obviously he'd been seen to and taken away. But my driver was very disappointed because he he wanted me to try and rescue this chap, and he thought it'd be great. This mad driver in the Highlands been rescued by Doctor Who. So <laughs> that didn't really happen. But getting there was, um, but it was great. I mean, I love adventures like that. It was arriving. Um, we stayed in this glorious inn. Um, my character, well, I suppose like the, I was part of a double act with Fraser Hines, who I know very well. We're old mates, and we were playing two old codgers, really. Two sad old men who's um, running away from Christmas to the Highlands. And, you know, the, the inn was a place where we could go and try and, you know, forget it. In fact, I mean, a lot of people have been doing that now during this lockdown. Bit sad, really. But in in this in it, there's the comedy, um, the layer of comedy on top of the sadness. You know, I like that kind of work. I like doing that. Um, playing, you know, there's a scene in it where you know you can see where I go and chat to the young lady, and um, it's kind of a sad scene, and it's lovely to do. Whereas the other bit is just two old farts um, getting drunk on whiskey in the bar. Uh, we get paid for that as well. I mean, we got paid for that. I mean, not a lot, but, you know, whiskey as well. Yeah, hey, sign me up for that. That's amazing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> it's, it's really interesting, actually, because a lot of the, the reviewers and feedback that's been coming back, a lot of people know, uh, sort of ch- name check that particular scene that you're talking about with, with yeah. Natalie as being one of the high points of the whole film. Um, and that's that's really nice because you, you, it's one of these moments where you really want this to work. And you, I like to I like to kind of try and do something a bit unpredictable with people, um, and particularly particularly when you work with people like Sylvester and Fraser and Claire, and they're all known for certain things and doing things a certain way. To try and kind of try and do something that maybe hasn't been seen too much of them, and tap into you know yeah. the hidden talents. Uh, is always quite interesting. I mean, we did it with Fraser on a short film before this um, called Sundown. That was uh, a lovely film. I saw that. That, that oh, was what you. made me want to work with you because it was very touching. Beautiful film. Thank you. Uh, well, it was one. It was one of those strange stories where, um, because it was about. I won't get too much into this, but because it was, because it was a, about a character who had t- a terminal illness, uh, and Fraser has been diagnosed with cancer like twice. Um, and I kind of, and we had these conversations. I said, I'm not going to tell you how to act. I just want to talk, let's talk about 
when you were there, what were you going, what were you thinking about, what were your first thoughts? And we kind of just had, that's kind of where we went. And then you got to see this really subtle sort of performance, which you don't normally see from Fraser. And again, the same is true here with Sylvester, uh, just kind of playing this really sort of low-key scene, uh, even though it's surrounded by all these big moments of comedy. Um, and it's great to kind of to have these great moments, but then you kind of bring it right down and you kind of just watch these two actors just kind of really sort of hone in uh, what they've got to do here. And it's, it's really impressive to watch that. Uh, and it's, it's really satisfying when, you, when it works as well, because you know you've got a moment um, which, you know, audiences will connect to. Yeah. Mm. Absolutely. And I know working with Sylvester in the past too, it's always nice to, to see you work and do your bush circuit and your comedy and have so much fun with that. But some of the most chilling moments in film is like exactly what you're talking about, Ryan, is bringing mm -hmm. it down. And it, a lot of the greatest actors are comedians who can be chameleons and really drop down and have those emotionally deep conversations. And I'm so excited to see that scene, Sylvester. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> oh, good. Well, let's hope you yeah. enjoy it. I, I, yeah. I want to see more dramatic roles from Sylvester. Yes. Oh, well, listen, I'm just, uh, I'm going to um, blow my own trumpet. I, I was in a film called Owners, which has come out, and mm. it was on at the um, London uh, Fright Festival, Film Fright Festival in London. And um, I got the uh, Best Actor Award for a horror film. Fabulous. Long so I'm good. I'm good at horror as well. <laughs> well, again, that's again that's what it works really well. If you do something when you do horror, it works really well when you play it really straight. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. like Robin Williams did, like a like a dark role. You know, like Insomnia. Straight. It's yeah. terrifying, and that's what it works best. Um, so yeah, yeah. I oh, I need to see that. I, to my shame, I haven't seen it yet. Oh, right. it's on my list. Have you seen it, um, owners, um, Kelsey? No. no, is it on Amazon, Netflix? How can I watch it? I think it came out in America. I mean, I guess because of all this um, Corona thing, you know, don't know where anything's been seen anywhere. And I'm not really all that au fait with them. Um, I mean, I've got, you know, uh, Netflix and, um, you know, kind of uh, Amazon Prime. I hope they send me some money now. I've just advertised them. Anyway, I've got them. <laughs> them and, uh, you know, I know how to tune into that but i'm not sure where it is it's out there somewhere it's it's got, i'm sure it's on amazon prime i'm pretty sure it is yeah there. it's um Maisie williams is in it and the Ooh. great rita tushingham who you may not know but who's an amazing actress from the 60s and 70s oh brilliant great so the owners so i'll google it the owners yes Ooh. yeah the trailer makes it look rather terrifying Ooh, amazing <laughs> this sounds good for a cozy weekend holiday movie night yes <laughs> a double bell both of them exactly yes. back yeah. to back double feature um yes i mean yeah macaulay double bell oh, there we go yes <laughs> <laughs> um so tell me more about how this film came together um who who came up with the story and how did the writing come about and the production um i this was an originally a short film called perfect strangers that some of us made um back in 2014 and I came up with it on a train um I'd spent a number of years trying to get another film together called Journey Bound that Sylvester was also attached to um and it was one and it was a bigger budget project and we were learning the business and figuring it all out and it kept falling down you know you get oh, you get so close that you get weeks to go and then something would fall apart and that's kind of the frustration was gathering and through that process um, they're all people always push you when you're developing films to make a, a teaser reel or a fake trailer or something, mm -hmm. and I hate that because it's a it's a completely pointless exercise, and that you can't do you've got material that you can't do anything with apart from show to a couple of investors. So I decided I would rather do something that stood on its own two feet on its own that was separate to that film, but also kind of displayed the genre and the tone of what we wanted to achieve. So. We come up with this, we tried to come up with something that was a bit of a road trip, but set in the Highlands and could be its own thing. And I wanted to do something about Christmas. One of my favorite films of all time is Playing the Strains and Automobiles with John Candy and Steve Martin. Oh, uh, I just saw that the other night. I really watched it. It's great. fantastic. It is a great mix of comedy and drama. And there's some really touching moments in that. I mean, mm -hmm. I for forbid anyone not to watch that and shed a tear. And 
that was what I wanted to achieve. Um, so I came up with this, this basic concept um, based the whole idea of something that comes into your life, makes an impact and goes away again. Um, and that, that's, that was the, the crux of it. And it was very loosely based on a conversation I had with someone on a train when I was very young, about 18 years old, um, maybe even younger. Uh, we were on our way to Manchester Airport from Glasgow on the train and it was packed and I was just wandering up and down and uh, there was this girl sit, sat on the floor in between the compartments and un I wasn't the most catty person or get I can talk to anyone but starting a conversation I'm ne I've never been great at that but for somehow a conversation started and before I knew it, I was on the floor as well and we just sort of chatted for hours and the, uh, I can't and I cannot tell you what we talked about literally cannot remember a thing but then you know she got to her station before i got to mine oh, cool catch you later off she went that was it gone uh you know and then before the days of internet so you couldn't even track someone down even if you did have their name and it was just that sort of in that moment someone sort of arrived in your space made an impact and then and then went on their way and i love that idea and that always stuck with me so um i kind of utilized that and you know and extrapolated it and developed it into something bigger with snow with snow <laughs> <Or not. laughs> and whiskey <laughs> absolutely with a little snow indeed and so and just a, a little bit of tangent how did you guys meet initially Ooh. um for Did my, you mug me once? Did you mug yeah, me that was once it. in Glasgow? I'm, I'm pretty much just came up to you and forced a script in your hand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for my convention? sins. Yeah, well, it was at the convention. Yeah, I am. Um, I'm going to admit to this. Um, I had just finished training as an actor. And in Scotland, it's very hard to get break in as an actor or a filmmaker or anything. Anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, uh, so a bunch of us decided to get together and do something just for well to enjoy it, do something different, uh, and get an audience. Um, and there'd been this big s surge of fan fiction in film for like a lot of students and sort of upcoming filmmakers would do sort of big budget Star Wars or Batman or things that were and they were done really really well. Um, and no one had cracked the Doctor Who thing. Um, and me being a big fan kind of noticed that the, most of them were all kind of very kind of amateur in your back garden in the local woods type affair with a, a, the kind of camcorder you'd turn up to a wedding in. Um, so we That's decided... what it was like in the BBC when I did it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so we, we did this thing um, and we took it very seriously. It was very dark um, and quite emotive. Um, and we started getting asked to conventions to show it and talk about it and do all these kind of, which was bizarre. I was like, oh, really? I'm, we're, we know, we know, you know, we're not legitimate. We're, we're fake and we're probably two steps away from getting sued. But <laughs> um, so we, yeah, we just started going to these conventions and you're thrown in there with, with the guests from the real show uh, who all look at you about funny thing. Who's that? Um, <laughs> and yeah, so you just meet people and then, you know, um, uh, a very good friend of my wife's um, runs a convention in Swansea in Wales called Regenerations that Sylvester's always at as well. And we kind of met there. Um, well, yes, so I like to go to it because I can go and visit Dylan Thomas Museum. <laughs> and also the fans, but I mean, that's one of the, the joys of Swansea. So yes, that's right. We used to meet in the bar afterwards, didn't we? After Absolutely, the yeah. The, um, the various things, duties one had to do. Indeed. To chat. Yeah. And you just, you just talk, you get to know folk, and then, you know, you click with some people you do, and some you don't. Um, yeah, we seem to get on and just kind of planted that seed that we should do something. Indeed. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. And so, Sylvester, did you see this short film before you say said yes, or, like, how did it come about? Um, and I know you mentioned that you saw Ryan's previous film as well. Um, but how did it come about where you were like, yes, I'll do it? Well, no, I, I hadn't seen the short film that, with the, the, that um, uh, it was called Perfect Strangers, mm. uh, was based on. I hadn't seen that, but I, it was the, 
the the film that we mentioned earlier i saw that and was mightily impressed uh, by it um it was very good so that kind of thought well this chap seems to know what he's doing um and he's not just some drunken fan in the bar at night <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure you get all the time. I remember walking through the West End with you and getting you were getting bombarded by people and it was just so fascinating. Yeah, that well, I owed them all that money. I mean, I you know, I shouldn't really they're always after me. <laughs> I remember once a number of years ago when we were trying to get Journey Bound together and um I went location scouting to the Isle of Sky and Fraser came along mm. and the producer at the time said are you sure this will be all right? We're not going to get mobbed or all these fans sort of turning out. Right. It's when Scottish Islands, no one will recognize them. It will be fine. Don't worry about it. He pulled up to this pub that he wanted to visit, this famous pub. Um, and there's a motorbike park next to where we parked the car. And they've just come out the bar and they're just getting back on the motorbike as we get out. And literally, I wasn't even out the car. He was out before they went, aren't you Joe from Emmerdale? And I was like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> Well, these guys can't go anywhere uh, without being recognised. Didn't you have an instant at the Still Game live show as well, where you tried to sneak in? Oh yes, well, um, for those that don't know really, Still Game uh, is, I mean, this is something that you should push on Scots Week. It's one of the great comedy series from Scotland. It's just a wonderful piece of work. It's about, by two, it will originally started off being written written by two young comic writers um, who uh, play old men. And it's about being still game, still there, still at it, still game. Mm. And um, but now they've actually done it for such a long time, they've grown into the characters. <laughs> Makeup budget went down. <laughs> but it's, um, yeah. So I, I had one, uh, I did one episode for them. I mean, they've done many years of it. I only did one episode. I played Archie and he was this, um, uh, you know, kind of chap who'd hold up in a, his, his flat in Glasgow and never came out. But they had to come along and knock down the building for some reason. So he had to come out. So they had been at school with them. So they came to see him and they came out and they, it, they took me on a, a trip of modern Glasgow. I hadn't been out for 40 years. And so that was the journey. It was great fun. We had a great laugh. And he was called Archie. And, so anyway, I did that, you know, it was a sh and many other things went off. And then I came back um, to Glasgow to do a play. And suddenly I realized I was world famous in Glasgow for nothing else except being that one half hour in Still Game. I'd walk down the street and people shout out, hey, Archie, are you, they've let you out, they've let you. And so that, I found that really weird. Um, and, uh, then this thing is so successful they did a big kind of uh, tour live of the show in huge, big barns and places, you know, thousands, 10,000 people would turn up. It was like a rock concert. Mm -hmm. And I, I was up in Glasgow, I thought, I'll, I'll go pop along and have a look, see the lads and go around and say hello to them. So I walked into this, having completely forgotten about the park. I walked in to the, uh, the big exhibition center in Glasgow and suddenly, all these people, 10,000 people were shouting, hey, Archie! And at first I wondered who Archie was, and then realized it was me, and I was <laughs> felt very embarrassed, and I wanted to hide, because I thought, oh my God! And, you know, it was really weird, but um, I'm world famous in Glasgow for being Archie. Nothing else, nothing else. <laughs> no, I'm very proud of Archie. <laughs> oh, goodness, I have to start calling you Archie. No, just kidding. <laughs> but still game is, uh, you know, something that you might want to look into in Scots Week because it really is a great piece of Glasgow humour, which is, um, you know, it, it, it's uh, it's not just f f frothy. I mean, mm. it's, you know, it's hard, it's harsh, and it's hilarious. Uh, hey, that's good, isn't it? Hard, harsh, and hilarious. Yeah, well, uh, that, that's really, it is. It's, it's really well written as well. I mean, Ford and yeah. Greg are really, really talented writers. They're really... Um, they're really quite sharp. Um, and I've done a little bits and pieces with Ford and you just kind of, and his brain doesn't switch off. You're kind of, you, you watch him. I mean, he was script editing on this Journey Bound script for us and you kind of, you, kind of, you send him a draft and he'd call you up 10 o'clock on Sunday night. He goes, you got a pen? No, right, 
go get a pen. I'm calling you back in five minutes. I've got notes for you. Uh, and he literally, he looked, you know, four minutes and 59 seconds, the phone goes, and it's like, right, da 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 da. This is great. This is great. That's crap. Change this. Try that. You know, it's, it's, listen, you just, the guy was on fire. Um, and that really shows in the writing the, the, um, and all the acting is great. I mean, Sanjeev Kohli, who is also in our film, is one yeah. of the and he's got this really dry, he's one of the few people that can do dry sarcasm really, really well. To the point where we had dialogue for his character in our script. That the producers told me, right, you need to write two versions because if Sandy, is, if you can't convince him to be in this film, uh, you're going to have to rewrite those lines because no one else is getting away with it. Uh. <laughs> Thank goodness he did it because he was lovely and wonderful. Because I guess I, I guess I work with him on still get. He also on radio has a thing called uh, it's a corner shop in Glasgow because he's um, uh, Asian and so he, it's a kind of. Uh, so it's like mags, bags, and fags, isn't it? That's yeah, yeah, yeah. Those mags, bags, and fags, cigarettes. Uh, not, not your. It's not mags, bags, and gay men. Uh, I think that's an American thing, isn't it? Um, but uh, he, uh, he, I was in that as well. I did a little bit in that. Great fun. Mm. This is such a small world too, because you. I love. Just well, I yes, I'm only five foot six. Oh, no, actually, I'm now. I've, re I've shrunk. I'm now five foot four, two, two, no, two. I've lost four inches. Don't know where it's gone. If you find it, could you send it back, please? Yeah. It's small. <laughs> well, I'm using it right now because I really wanted to be taller, but maybe in a minute. It's in your head, <laughs> <next to me. laughs> Oh my goodness. No, I just, I just love hearing you guys bounce back and forth and it's so true. And, and um, I guess leading into that, um, you were talking about earlier, Ryan, that you know it is really hard sometimes as an actor, a filmmaker, a creative artist, trying to get into this world if you're in Scotland or anywhere. Um, but what are some positive things that you're really excited about with the TV and film industry in Scotland? And where do you see some major shifts happening? Um, well, it's kind of it's an it's an interesting time because after years and years of pushing, we finally have a, a studio being built in Edinburgh. Oh, um, wow! Yeah, exactly, uh, and it's been led by Sean Connery's son, uh, Jason Connery. Yeah, and it's been a long, long time in the making. Lots of politics. Some people want it in Glasgow. Some people want it in Edinburgh. They don't. If they can't have it in Glasgow, they don't want it at all. Uh, and it's just a sort of it's taken a long time to get there. And Hollywood does show a lot of interest in Scotland, but quite often they end up going elsewhere. They go to Ireland. Like They, they famously lost out on Game of Thrones because they didn't have a studio. Uh, they lost out on majority of Braveheart because they didn't have the space um, or the correct tax breaks. Or there's loads of different reasons that um, we've lost out over the years. And slowly that's been building up. And obviously Outlanders have a huge deal over here. It employs so many local people. And what I think what eventually got the studios in Edinburgh going is the fact that Outlander came over here and went to hell with it. We're going to build our own studios, um, which they have done. They've, they've converted a farm uh, into, a, into a full-on studio, which, which is what they use. And it's great. And it's given people a, a, the nudge that things can get done and really have to get done because um, there's a lot of opportunity. A lot of people want to come and work here. Um, and that's great. And then the next thing that I think needs to happen is there needs to be more homegrown productions that have the in commercial genre that get going. Uh, we have a bad habit of doing a lot of kitchen sink drama and sort of more art house pieces, which are fine and have their place as they do in every film industry around the world. But what we don't do is we don't do the commercial genres that can travel abroad. Um, I mean, I, I showed... Um, a sensational Scottish film uh, to a sales agent. Um, not not something I worked on, something that a friend of mine made. And they came back and said, yeah, it's great. But the problem is it's it's too Scottish. It is, I can't sell it. And it's like, and I know exactly what they mean because it's stuff that isn't made to travel. Um, so they need to kind of, uh, and Lost at Christmas is not the only example of it, but it's very deliberately been made to travel. It's to engage audiences around the world not just in Scotland uh, and showcase Scotland at the same time but we need more of that the only way this it's great for me to go in and make something and say this is this is what this is for but what it really needs 
to have a sustainable industry is to have a bunch of a bunch of filmmakers being supported to create these films that 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 do travel and they do it's a business at the end of the day and it needs to it needs to gain revenue it needs to make money uh, so it can come back to the industry and it can allow others to be developed and 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 be produced basically and that i think that i think is the answer to how things have to go next and i think particularly with um what's happened this year with covid and all the big blockbusters pulling out of cinemas and near, near enough making them all bankrupt um it's a time as well for around the world for everyone to re-examine what is a what is a cinema experience it's not just about these tentpole big cgi films that bring in a billion dollars a time it's about diversity it's about different stories it's about smaller films bigger films uh, like 10 10 years ago you would happily go and see a small psychological thriller like insomnia by christopher nolan one of his first films with al pacino you would not get a film like that in cinemas today because they're queuing out the door with all these big superhero things so i think now when people are realizing that that's not economically viable that the answer to this is to make smaller films that are that are tailored towards a cinema audience it's yes yeah, it's, it's fascinating really um the, the the sad thing is because there hasn't been a studio um and there hasn't been a really scottish film industry for a long time is that that we haven't found the story we tell if you mm. go to sweden norway denmark they, the story they tell is, you know, kind of Scandi Noir, and they do mm. it brilliantly, and they, it go, goes all over the world. It's their story. It's their. It comes out. I mean, it comes out of their long, long winters, and the. Um, I mean, I suppose the same kind of thing could be developed in Scotland because we have similar weather. Um, but it, we we need. We did. I mean, there was way back. There were things like Whiskey Galore or Parahandy, or there was a time a black and white film where Scotland was making and being, you know, we had oh, lots yeah. of great Scottish actors and, you know, but that, but that's, that disappeared. Mm. And that's what we've got to find. And we've also got to find the story that we tell. Yeah, Whatever absolutely. way we tell it. I think we need a renaissance of things like Whiskey Galore and the Maggie and even stuff like the Bill Forsyth films, uh, Local Hero, uh, or even like, even I mean, like Restless Natives, up. you know. Yeah, but also the to... dark stuff. I mean, you know, some, hmm. you know, we've got great writers, you know, um, who write, you know, uh, well, I mean, um, uh, what's the one about the train? My brain's gone. Um, train spotter, is that? Yeah, train spotter, yeah. yeah. There's not a train in it, by the way, but yeah. No, no. <laughs> but but the, 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 that, that kind of world is. Um, oh, exactly, yeah. And I think, I mean, we, we, do, we do crime drama very well as well. Um, yeah. as well and I think what does get forgotten is we, we should be telling these darker stories uh, uh, but quite often it gets forgotten that film is predominantly you know at a base level film is an entertainment medium and that gets forgotten so a lot of times you get these very dark stories that don't come with a genre wrapper to allow an audi a general audience to engage with it, um, whether it's devoid of narrative or it's a bit too art house. I think there needs to be more that's kind of tailored towards tell these stories, but tell them within the confines of what, uh, of what film is there to engage and to entertain. Yeah, but I mean, you know, dark films entertain, you know. Yeah, the exactly. Beast with five if... Fingers, The Beast with Five Fingers. Oh, that was so terrifying. I was a little boy. When I watched it, it was so frightening that I could only watch it through the buttonhole of my raincoat. The whole <laughs> thing, I watched the, the whole thing like that. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't a Scottish film, but it was just... Uh, I watched it in Scotland, in uh, uh, the La Scala de Noon, <laughs> when I was a wee boy. Oh, I can't hear you. <laughs> Yeah, there was a leaf blower outside. Thank you, uh, quarantine life. Um, <laughs> but I remember watching uh, Wicker Man for the first time, and that it, talking about. I think that it, I think that one has a good combination of being completely dark and sinister, but at the same time, it has this 
you go into it thinking like, oh, beautiful scenery. There's, you know, these sensuality and nature and all this really cool stuff. But then there's like a twist and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so dark. Um, but yeah, you're right. If it's into a genre and we do have, it's kind of like the, there's all those books about, there's only seven different types of stories you can tell and you can mix and match, and, but there's still a formula of it. And when you go outside of that for, formula, it gets kind of tricky, like Memento, that kind of really broke, um, at least in the indie world, kind of the the mold of how to uh, linear, what is the word, linear? Like time, yeah, yeah, yeah. time telling the story, yeah. Um, so yeah, it'll be very, very interesting to see how, filmmaking shifts and I know with Scott we, we struggle with because the American audience we have this romanticism of Scotland we love Outlander because it's this like we want to get our kilts on and our tartan we want to celebrate our history and you know that my Scottish ancestor came over in 1732 so I mean but I'm still like yeah I'm, I'm like mostly Scottish and the Scots are like yeah okay we don't care. <laughs> you have fun with your Highland Games, um, but we're ready to move on to sustainability, wind farms, you know, creating dolly and clone sheep and all these innovative things. Um, so it's so fascinating to see films like Lost at Christmas. We're in this, you're in this beautiful scenery, romantic Scotland, but then it tells a really human story that about real people going through some things and that no matter where you are in the world you can come together and have community 